Welcome back to Post Postmodernism, a map for the present, uh, which accompanies the exhibition Everything at Once Postmodernity 1967 to 1992 at Bundeskunsthalle. The exhibition is the result of a lot of conversation, conversations <laughs> with uh, people who know more about specific fields than we do. For example, we were lucky to share a lot of conversations with Dietrich Dietrichsen, cultural theorist, professor at the Academy of Arts in Vienna. And he has published on the subjects of the show since um, 19, I guess, like 70 something when he wrote for Sounds. He was later the chief editor of Spex magazine in Germany. In 1983, he published the book Schocker, Stile und Moden der Subkultur, which was like a German version of Dick Heptich groundbreaking book, Subculture, the Meaning of Style. Dietrich has published widely on pop music, um, über pop music, also in English, uh, published on pop music, is his most comprehensive um, sum up of his theory of pop. And without further ado, I would like to ask Dietrich to enter the stage. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Koya. Yeah, in, in honor of Dick Heptich's book, this uh, talk is called The Meaning of Style. Um, the, the book that, that you're referring to was basically not a book of mine. It was a book that someone in Germany had bought the rights to Dick Heptich's book, The Meaning of Style. And they thought they could not really sell this. So they, they asked two more authors to contribute. And that was, and I was one of them. Um, that style has a meaning beyond itself, it even can be seen as a form of resistance, be it through its readability, its meaning, or its intentional non-readability, its avoiding uh, meaning. This idea has a very specific history, a cultural as well as an academic history. Music journalists, rather than fashion experts, started to read, decipher fashion ideas by bands or musicians and cover designers since the 1950s. Fashion needed to be read and or translated, interpreted, because it existed in a world outside the fashion world, which had its traditional ways of dealing with looks and innovations. Music journalists needed to read sound effects and dress inventions in one interpretive or evaluative act, together with performance elements and many other layers. And they often placed their results in sociological perspectives, in kind of self-made sociological perspectives, theories of movements, subcultures, and countercultures. In the academic world, it was the tradition of British cultural studies, the, the, the Birmingham School, uh, which dedicated volumes and dissertations on phenomena of youth cultural fashion and style as resistance and produced, among others, a book like Subculture, The Meaning of Style by Dick Heptich. I'm taking this book, which was published in 1979, as a starting point in so far as it literally proposes a meaning to style, stress its, its importance, and it seems that it says subculture, the social entity, is the meaning. Style is the signifier and subculture is the signified. Um, it is not the place and time here to examine how exactly this works in depth, whether this is a symptom, the, the style is a symptom of the social reality, an index, or a product. So I will concentrate on a series of historical um, instances, perspectives, re that could reconstruct how these two components could form a relation under different periods. And of course, in honor of this show, why and when this relation became something that could be qualified as postmodern. In the beginning, whenever this was, there was a, a modernist gendered situation, let's say in the 1950s. The, the, the male style was supposed to be unmarked, default clothes, the man in the gray flannel suit. 
women's styles were marked, designed. They were all about to be marked and to be read. Although meaning would rarely develop from a transgression and uh, carry social novelties, but rather from meeting an idea, fulfilling an expectation. But that was to be reached individually. A woman was supposed to follow the rules, but she could develop her own style of how to do that. Basically, how to sell an individualism as rule supporting and rule support, as if it was totally personal, freely chosen. Men's styles only had one way to qualify themselves or distinguish them. They had to be precious, expensive, technically good, well-made dresses, high quality, expensive fabric. But no discussion of individuality, only of wealth and power. The quality aspect, by the way, counts for both genders and is, of course, class-related. And there were, of course, also things like dresses for certain occasions, stage dresses and so on. There was already queer usages of style. Uh, but in none of these, meaning was transgressive. The meaning was occasion, stage, or queer. There was only one way to develop a social, non-tautological meaning in style under these circumstances, and that was dressing down. Dressing down, dressing poorly, Dressing as if one was poor. Now, Bohemians had always done this, but only in small numbers. In the 1960s, an entire generation was dressing down. Jeans, parkas, t-shirts, and dirty. This was the first style where the meaning was subculture. The problem was that dressing down would only become meaningful when it was also codified. So it was not free. You could not just let yourself go, get dirty and dirtier, and let your, let your dresses decompose. Dressing down was also codified. You had to wear a Lee jeans, not the cheap jingless jeans. It was sometimes quite expensive to dress poorly. And it was arbitrary, but mandatory, which item was the one that could signify what there was to signify for sub and countercultures under certain local and historical circumstances. That was not always the same. It was just the way the signification was pre presented that was um, the constant of this um, model. There were no stars or ad campaigns deciding. At best, those were following. The decision had always to look as if it had not been made by human taste preferences, but by some kind of higher order, a Weltgeist, a historical mission. No wonder that Andy Warhol's uniform, blue jeans and white shirts, were a perfect example of that kind of dress code. Some decision that was not based on choice, but seemed to come from above and or beyond. The goal and subcultural social function of dressing down was to negate both sides of the state of things, the patriarchal and state-like side of capitalism, as represented by the unmarked dress codes of the man in the proverbial gray flannel suit, and as well the consumer capitalism with its increasing number of choices between commodities and dress codes as represented by female and queer and, and fantasy uh, fashion usage. You could negate both by negating the quality and priciness and orderliness of the male suit and the abundance of choices, ideology of creativity and self-realization associated with the establishment's female side. In order to do that, it was not enough to dress differently. One had to dress down with an inner authority, some guiding principle that by no means could be translatable into a simple thought, a normativity or a mere individual anarchic selection. People who were dressing down but then had funny hats, those were, they had no chance. Um, it needed to act as, um, it would be directed by some higher principle that would be self understood or religiously or ritually transmitted to the millions of initiated members of the global counterculture of the 60s and 70s, the last decades of modernism, in my humble opinion. Of course, one could say that some glorification of the worker was one guiding principle. But it was even more. The 
secret principle of the style was the fetishization of use value. From t-shirts to jeans to corduroy, trousers and lumberjack shirts, they all were practical and comfortable. And that killed them. Because this principle after a while was very transparent and it could be translated. It lost the countercultural mystique sometime in the 70s. During the dominance of this principle, there were already specific subcultures around, especially in Britain, that were not based on this general negation of patriarchal and consumerist capitalism. Of course, there was never such a thing as a globally organized and unified counterculture, but people believed, till a certain historical period, that they were part of some bigger movement, even if they could be sociologically broken down into many competing categories of subcultures, but they still believed in this one unmarked, glorious signifier of dressing down. But in those British subcultures already by the 60s, the divisions were a conscious part of the inner working of a certain subculture. Mods knew they were different from swinging London hippies and from rockers and so on. But still, the Who were playing Woodstock. Of course, members of Velvet Underground in New York and members of the Grateful Dead in San Francisco had less than nothing in common. Uh, here, the flower children, there, the nihilism and the sadomasochism. And they both knew this by 1967. But in 1966, they both still had the same name, the Warlocks. I'm saying that the belief in the one reason behind the universal dressing down was much stronger, much more important and regulative than the specific dresses and styles worn by people in reality. But it could not work when the main principle was finally decoded and when it was degraded from a magical fetishistic veneration of the principle of use value to an IKEA-like Scientology cult of use value as a substitute for bad democracy. Punk was the last desperate modernist attempt to save the old order by exaggerating the downdressing and the dirtiness, but it was already contaminated by creativity and the likes of Vivian Westwood and other people who preferred creativity over quasi-religious principles of dirtiness and radical downdressing. The postmodern moment would now be this. After punk, but also even earlier in glam rock, the notion arises that it is possible to signify by style not a general negation, not a too broad, tendentially lame refusal of exchange value in consumer culture, but of specific attitudes and ideas in the cultural world. For instance, Bowie's affirmation of queerness in the top of the pops show 1972, and that even before the, the, this postmodern moment. It should become possible to signify a specific tribe's consciousness. But the means of the stylistic signification would and should technically work just as powerfully as they did with the older counterculture, not as individual decisions, but as mysteriously, collectively assembled move. So the multiplied, diversified, different countercultures of around 1980 acted all as if they were, all of them, the next big thing although they were all some next big thing. So those were the words at that time, the no next big thing, that uh, the terminology of the search for a meaning of style. This was, def, this was so, so the, 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 the advertisement they were looking for, the next big thing. So different things were competing to be the next big thing. Early hip-hop, neo-moths, neo-romantics, so-called positive punk, young soul rebels, you name it. But they were all still believing, and with some good reasons, that their specific culture could only work if it would not be seen as a taste decision, as an offer for consumption, as a possible choice, but as the one and only truth. For short periods along the logic of quickly changing next big things, this could work, but not in the long run. You would enter the logic of a football fan. They also all also believe that their team is an eternal truth, a metaphysical entity beyond experience and logic, and that this is the precondition of the mythic logic of never walking alone. But they also know that every major league has 18 or 16 or 20 of these eternal truths. And the major leagues are just the tip of the iceberg. But still, in the postmodern moment, a lot was invested to stabilize the new polytheism as not a market, but really a pantheon as serious as the old god. 
Magazines like The Face and ID thematize the option that you could wish intentionally that something would become a sociological fact just by dressing in a certain way, hoping somebody would do, make a photograph and somebody would uh, recognize a sociological fact. You could hang out on some high street, bring a photographer, record a seven inch and then make the whole world read you until you become a sociological entity, a new you thing. Make Stuart Hall or Paul Willis or Simon Friss eager to analyze your tribe. And in this situation, I will, would like to give you an example for this strategy. Uh, initially, I wanted to, to, to play the song, but this is not possible technically with the streaming, so I have to sing it to you. Um, it's, it's by Dexy's Midnight Runners, and it's called There, There, My Dear. Dear Robin, I hope you don't mind me writing. It's just that there's one more thing I need to ask you. If you're so anti-fashion, why not wear flares instead of dressing down all the same? It's just that looking like that, I can express my dissatisfaction, dear Robin. Let me try to explain, but you never see in a million years. Keep quoting Cabaret, Berlin, Burroughs, J.G. Ballard, Duchamp, Beauvoir, Kerouac, Kierkegaard, Michael Rennie. I don't believe you really like Frank Sinatra. Robin, you're always so happy. How the hell? You'd like a dumb, dumb patriot. If you're supposed to be so angry, why not fight? And let me benefit from your right. Do you know the only way to change things is to shoot men who arrange things? Robin, I'd explain it to you, but you never see in a million years. Well, you made your rules. But we don't know that game. Perhaps I listen to your records, but your logic's far too lame, and I'd only waste three more valuable minutes of my life with your insincerity. You see, Robin, I'm just searching for the young soul rebels, and I can't find them anywhere. Where have you hidden them? Maybe you should welcome the new soul vision. Welcome the new soul vision. This is... Uh... <laughs> I don't know if any one of you has ever heard the song, how it's supposed to be sung. Um, um, its title is There, There, My Dear. And uh, a few years earlier, Marvin Gaye, the great soul singer, uh, was in a divor divorce um, um, law case, um, lawsuit, and um, had lost a lot of money to his ex-wife. And uh, he needed to pay for that, and so he recorded an album uh, just with songs about the, the, the downfall of their marriage. And this, this album was called Here, Here, My Dear. So um, um, Dexys Midnight Runners refer to this when they call this There, There, My Dear. And then they, uh, they're, they're, there is this guy, this older friend, Robin, who's obviously a representative of the old subculture, the old unified counterculture. And he's so anti-fashion. Um, but uh, but he's keeping keep quoting all the time a certain canon of hipster uh, culture: um, J.G. Ballard, Burroughs, Duchamp, Kerouac, uh, Kierkegaard. Uh, but he's not he's not sincere because he doesn't like Frank Sinatra, um, and and he is political, but he's not but he's not fighting. And he doesn't understand that the, the logic of politics is that the only way to change things is to shoot men who arrange things. So, very radical. Um, so this is the, the proposal here. Um, popular taste, Frank Sinatra instead of hipster taste. Soul rebels who would shoot men who arrange things, so radical, and profession. Uh, not anti-fashion, uh, and this is, an, this is a this is a, a proposal of for a subculture that's called the New Soul Rebels, and uh, this, this band, Dexys Midnight Runners, uh, they, they invested in this for about a year. Uh, their videos and the one that I wanted to show you, and and songs that kind of support this this idea, but different from from what um, normally 
is sort of anything goes in uh, the, the understanding of the normal understanding of anything goes in postmodernism that really anything goes the important point is that not anything goes uh, it seems like an odd mixture soul armed struggle um, uh, and frank sinatra uh, but um, this this combination only does work if you if you act really serious if you if you go for something really big like armed struggle mm -hmm. and then it's it's like cool to to mention frank sinatra and this is a this is a strategy and this i would say is the first it has been several people have tried this i mean uh, could mention lots of other examples uh, and it worked for the first years in this postmodern moment um, but it also soon fell apart this construction because of its economy of science it still acted as if it would be based on one gigantic negation like the only way to change things is to shoot men who arrange things but coupled this with a very special fashion orientation not with any real subversive army of non-conformists out there and this helped to reinvest in the categories of fashion but equally devalued countercultural ambitions of the big refusal no, Herbert Marcuse, that the, the idea of the old counterculture. Um, of course, serious people, also the cultural studies world, would not take such grandiose statements for sociological facts. Um, the only one who took them seriously were a new postmodern news culture, which indeed developed a new relationship with fashion investing in the category of fashion, the existentialist seriousness that one can still sense in its leftovers debates about, for example, cultural appropriation these days. How did this work? We have to go back for a second to the initial situation, the gender divide between marked female and unmade male styles. One discovery of the postmodern generation that became visible in the 80s was the fact that the old subcultural or countercultural order of dressing down was also an order of unmarkedness. It was still indebted to the old patriarchal panic in the face of fashion statements. Because one was afraid to be identified as consumerist or as gay or as a woman. With the new generation of queer or pro-queer aesthetics and practices in the early 80s, like Boy George, Soft Cell and many others, the disadvantage became an advantage. It became a statement in itself not necessarily to wear something specific, but to be pro-fashion, to be pro-decision, to be pro, uh, uh, putting on display that you were making choices. And this is one moment that became important and was new. It lasted, of course, only as long as it was possible to really behave as if consumer goods and fetishes were in themselves a queer negation of the patriarchal side of the capitalist order, it began to wear out during the 90s and disappeared in the zeros, its final stage maybe being TV shows like Sex in the City, in which female hetero fashion victims had to act like drag queens in order to be credible. The other option that was possible after the first postmodern attempts uh, fell apart was the quote as a sort of artificiality it has been a lot of talk about the quote already a quote as a source of artificiality and markedness and constructedness you no longer presented yourself as the result of your sovereign and free or adequate and conformist decision but as the less sovereign product of influences that you would carry around with you in the form of quotes as it, as to demonstrate that you are not in charge of yourself, that your subjectivity is an arena of cultural battles, that you are, that you are socially constructed and proud of it. This was the other option. Its problem, finally, was the source of the quotes. Uh, the fact that, that quoting in terms of taking something from somewhere uh, also always means that the somewhere where you're taking it from, it has meant something and there were investments in it. In order to be to able to convincingly argue, I'm just a bunch of quotes. I'm, const I'm made from either things that have shaped me without my knowledge or uh, I'm made from things that I love. In order to say one or the other, the quote cannot develop a life of their own which they have, uh, and especially the strong ones, the ones that you desire to use. So one result of the quotation 
based idea of pop music and its styles was that pop music of uh, the postmodern variety in which especially like white British people quoted black artists with a different attitude and a different intention than black pop music of the time, early hip hop for example, quoted black music, sometimes the same sources. The gesture, look, this is my history, uh, uh, is very different from the gesture, I can own everything by quoting it, be it my history or someone else's. When this becomes obvious, the quote is no longer just a quote referring to just something, but it becomes a statement again, a proposition for which someone, you, can be held responsible. And then postmodernism is over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dietrich. And now we're going to hear more on style, but from a different perspective, the perspective of new models, a media platform um, mainly based in Berlin and run by Carolyn Buster, formerly art critic of Art Forum, and um, Julian Wadsworth, um, who uh, has been a music producer and video producer, um, and they both concentrated on community building and raising the content of their platform out of the community. It's the most um, advanced cultural theory that I regularly am happy to consume. Um, new models have also spoken last year here at the F Congress, the future of critique, and I very much uh, recommend their explanation of why mass media doesn't work anymore. Carly and Julian, please come on stage. Thank you. Sorry, Carly uh, shrank. Um, oh, okay. Okay, I think we should maybe give Hugo to Maria. Yes. So, <laughs> hold on. Do we have that? you as well. Without it, okay. Okay. Slides? Okay. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Bundeskunsthalle Bund, for having us. Thank you, Koya, uh, for in the invitation. And thank you, Diedrich, for that uh, incredibly useful framing of the changing correlation of style and subculture from modernism to postmodernism and into the present. Um, I'm Caroline Busta. I'm Lil Internet of the Media Node and Community that is new models. And that was our daughter Coco, who may still be joining us from the sidelines. Um, in any case, we want to take a few minutes to first digest what Diedrich just presented, and then to carry it forward into an exploration of how it might apply to the public arena that largely exists online today in 2023. Um, Diedrich, you begin with Dick Hebdige's canonical 1979 thesis on style, wherein style directly signifies one's cultural or subcultural belonging in this one-to-one -one way. Style is a signifier, as Hebdige says, and you recapitulate, subculture is a signified. This would be a modernist relationship. There's no abstraction. The sign tells the truth. The dollar represents X amount of gold. Subcultural style is interesting in this regard, given that, to cite Hebdige referencing Jean Genet in the intro, subcultural style begins with a crime against the natural order. It's the act of flexing a signifier, dressing down, or if a man, dressing femme, that refuses to represent one's class and gender in the expected true way. In this formulation, the signifier continues to tell the truth, but the truth that it's telling is now a politicized one. A person of X class and gender is directly, honestly refusing the natural order and who that order expects them to be. Or, Diedrich, as you say it, the goal here with subcultural style was to negate both the patriarchal state-like side of capitalism and the aspirational, big quotes, consumer side. 
But you underscore an important qualification. One couldn't simply assume a subcultural style. One had to embody this position. For the style to hold value, the signifier had to be a truthful reflection of one's belief. So this is still a modernist framework, right? So a subcultural style relation is still a one-to-one -one reflection of the true embodiment of this person's belief system. Of course, style is entropic, losing velocity and power the more often it's deployed. At the same time, the natural order that gave rise to post-war subcultural style was also coming undone. You skipped. Oh, did I? Oh, what did I? Oh, to assume, thanks. <laughs> to assume subcultural style without that embodied political position was, of course, to be a poser. And within that cultural logic, being a poser was pretty much the worst thing you could be, as it was to tell a lie that threatened the entire semiotic economy, undermining the strength of the subcultural signal foremost. Of course, style is entropic, losing velocity and power the more often it's deployed. At the same time, the natural order that gave rise to post-war subcultural style was also coming undone. The end of the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1971, famously, there's Nixon with Robocop, um, unlinking the dollar from the gold standard, the deindustrialization of the Northwestern hemisphere, shifting the masses from an economy built on making physical goods to one built on services, experiences, speculative finance, and pop culture. And of course, the neoliberalization of Western economies, making the creatively talented, socially oriented, expressive individual skilled at performing their identity, the new ideal subject. Diedrich, you show in your text how the formation of that subcultural energy shifted around this time from individual to collective expressions. Collective expressions that drew from a quote, quote, as you say, pantheon of cultural signifiers rather than just dressing down, to mix the codes and refuse recuperation of the new neoliberal hegemony, which forces you to express and be creative as an individual. To swiftly shift the collective style and thereby remain inscrutable to the masses, this, I believe you argue, marks the postmodern shift in subcultural style. Still, the style is telling the truth, sort of. The truth of a subculture that wants to authentically express itself in a time when authentic expression is exactly what the hegemonic order wants. But to do so adds an extra step between signifier and signified. In your essay, you go on to show this strategy was also ultimately recuperated. There's nothing on this slide. Uh, and so eventually, the only authentic gesture was to construct yourself in a knowing way by, compose, by compositing quotes of other artificial signs. To paraphrase, the goal was to convincingly argue, I am just a bunch of quotes. There's no real authentic me other than this collection of quotes, those things that have shaped me. So for us, these, for Julian and me, these last two points are really interesting. The postmodern shift of adding an extra space between signifier and signified, and two, a form of authenticity built from quotations. We think both of these are useful about thinking about how this, again, for lack of better word, subcultural energy formulates itself in a time of platform hegemony. hegemony. We also want to propose a shift in the formation of the individual subject, one that maybe has its roots in the Bliss Kids and the turn you mention where the demand for individual expression is countered by the embrace of the collective, a kind of cultural swarm logic that evades easy legibility. Since we don't have much time and we just received your text this morning, the one that you read today, um, excuse, excuse the telegraphic nature of our argument, but in broad strokes, we want to show that. Um, as media has become nonlinear, so too has the public sphere, so too of the social arrangements within it. Today, hegemonic power is encoded by our, oops, oh yeah, sorry, this is from last year. So this is linear media. You have like a direct like uh, stream from the event to the journalist, to the publication which gatekeeps to the audience. It's like a really, it's like a very, you know, 
kind of easy to comprehend. I'm oversimplifying it, but easy to comprehend formation of the public sphere. And you know, now it looks something more like this, um, where you have all these different nodes that are transmitting information, that are making codes in all these different places. So last year, standing in the same place, we argued how this changes what criticism is about, but it also changes fundamentally what social body, it, what, what the social, the public sphere looks like, what it is to be in a group, what it is, who you you're signaling to who you can reach. So keep this image in your head. Um, the second point is that hegemonic power is encoded by our digital interfaces. It's not even like the men in gray suits who are the men who control the men in gray suits. It's like, it's like you know, we think now Mark Zuckerberg wears a t-shirt. Like power is like, is like in the, in the sidelines. The real power is in the protocols, the, the coding that is running these platforms. Um, in that, these interfaces don't really care about any one natural order. In fact, they'd prefer for there to be as many natural orders as possible, ideally competing so as to maximize engagement, right? So like the more different takes there are on the problems, you know, uh, in Gaza right now, the happier the platforms are. They don't really take sides. Um, and so also online, the individual ends up having like three general options. Either they can be noise, and Julian's going to elaborate on this, um, they can attach themselves to a subgroup, which we would maybe call subculture formally, but some kind of subgroup or swarm, or else they can be a node. Um, basically, they can be an individual um, in big quotes, which would be like being an influencer, an agent of hegemonic power, aggregating attention, which can be sold to advertisers, and encouraging engagement, which can be advantageously harvested for AI learning sets and other uses within a refracted public sphere. And maybe even some of those AI learning sets is actually like a positive thing. These things don't even necessarily have like negative positive connotations. But it's to be an individual is to be like aligned with the hegemony. To have agency, one cannot just be noise, nor can one be a real name influencer. One must be part of a subgroup that establishes a protocol to misuse the flows of, uh, of digital interfaces for its own advantage. But so what does this mean for style and subcultural style? How does style function within this digital framework? And one note here, we're really speaking about style within the digital sphere, which we're taking as a primary arena for mass cultural evolution. Uh, we acknowledge that there are worlds and logics outside of this digital sphere, but that's outside the parameters of what we can address today. In Q3 of this year, Facebook broke the 3 billion user mark. Instagram now has 2 billion users and TikTok uh, about more than 1 billion users as well. Added to this is a rising tide of niche social, social platforms and startup independent spaces and servers. But billions of unique individuals creates essentially pure noise. So for individual users to receive and broadcast coherent signals, it's necessary to connect with networks. This is a, a network on Twitter uh, plotted, uh, showing all the relations between a subset of people. So one develops an identity, a stylistic code set, according to the online networks with which one wants to participate. On social media, the more attention a signal receives, the stronger it becomes. And because attention can be channeled with text, images, video, and audio, all of these co cultural units become interoperable, open to any kind of configuration. And it is by quoting and being quoted, to borrow a term from Diedrich, that attention flows and one's cultural identity is created. Uh, there are a few models within the platform that users can adopt to shape their online identity. The influencer or the pop star becomes a node broadcasting outward to a network. So they're the, the center and they broadcast essentially unidirectional, unidirectionally out to a broader network. However, the influencer loses their individuality, becoming instead an avatar for both capital and the desires of their audience. Uh, whatever the audience prefers, the influencer will keep doing because it's good for engagement and attention. 
So this influencer model could be considered the mainstream form of social media identity building, fully in line with the commercial and marketing purpose of the platform. And the influencer model can be replicated at all scales from the mega influencer to the micro influencer. It doesn't matter if you have just 10 followers, uh, you can still play that influencer role, adopt that broadcasting outward influencer model. Another, mo another model is to assemble and create a metaphorical uh, janitor's key ring of quotes and content that unlock various networks of shared affinities. This leads to a combination of weak and strong belonging to a variety of networks, some which may be youth cultures, fandoms, hobby groups, or communities like our own new models, which has members with diverse professional and cultural affiliations, but who all share an interest in critiquing and understanding emergent media phenomena. Finally, there's a model that is a dark twin of the influencer in that both essentially evacuate the private personhood of the individual. This is the model of the swarm. Swarms can gather around individuals or emerge from particular platforms, but members of swarms choose an anonymous rather than individual identity, freeing them from the restrictions and responsibilities of selfhood altogether. By synchronizing an affect and aesthetic across a multitude of users, swarms capture outsized attention through their ability to communicate and quote en masse. Two no notable swarms today include that of Milady, whose members adopt NFT avatars of anime girls to sow chaos and exert monetizable influence within the cryptocurrency networks of Twitter, and Angelicism, which developed around the writer and filmmaker Angelicism01, whose alternation between online trolling and critical theory-laden meditations on extinction attracted an intelligent but aggressive swarm of so-called Angelicism clones. Particularly interesting is the fact both of these online swarms devirtualize at events offline, at Milady raves and Angelicism film screenings, respectively. Their subversion of the marketable individual role that social media platforms were designed for, and the fact that they indeed manifest themselves in offline communities, makes the swarm the closest model to what would be a sub or counterculture in the past. Their politics, however, uh, particular politics, exceeds the scope of <laughs> our talk right now. If we think of the postmodern individual being in a world where signifier and signified are untethered and free to be reconfigured, social media could be considered the peak postmodern medium, a medium in which all other mediums are simulated for the benefit of individual expression. But as the platform age has worn on and the number of individuals online has proliferated, signifiers have become increasingly unstable. And this is just like a screenshot from AliExpress. And I, the text, I, sorry, I don't have a German translation, but I mean, you don't need one. I mean, it's, it, this has probably been auto-translated from, you know, Mandarin or from yeah, just various think of other... just random words. That's what it says. <laughs> I think my favorite is... Um, Great gift ideas. Pullover jacket goes well with all your jeans, leggings. It's a great gift ideas to give them out on the casual of some military style. So thank you for your hard work, <laughs> translators. Yeah, yeah. So you can see that like language is becoming a bit unhinged here. Sign and signifiers. It's just a bunch of keywords that are thrown together that will like hopefully attract as many users as possible. Probably not the best example as this one only has one review, but you could find endless examples like this. Um, um, so words themselves no longer seem to operate on a one-to-one -one relationship with their meaning, just like images don't. To say a certain word, to wear a certain garment, to style your post or DM with certain configurations of shorthands and emojis, like do you write just the letter U, do you spell out Y-O-U, do you find the emoji, do, you know, all these different forms matter, there's a kind of style, can mean dramatically different things to different groups of people. We are living in a time of not just individuals as noise, but semiotic noise, where participation in groups or swarms are necessary not just to define oneself in contradistinction to the society, but to define oneself within society at all, to be legible at all to others. 
I really like this quote. It's by a political scientist, Kevin Munger. Um, if you and your community do not have a concrete set of norms, practices, and institutions designed to allow you to use the internet without the internet using you, you are destined to lose. In fact, you're not even trying to win. So it's like this core strategy of surviving in the mediascape today is to find some kind of affinity group and to develop protocols for transiting across all the different platforms. If we had more time, we would attempt to bring in Willem Flusser's concept of the technical imagination here, where the image is not just a one-to-one -one index of what it's representing. Rather, it's a composite of what is being depicted, the operator's intentions for deploying that image sign and the protocol of the technology used to create and disseminate the image. If you'll excuse the jump, one can maybe think here of the Blitz Kids as operators creating a space between signifier and signified a collective performative deployment of a sign that only other people in their world could immediately understand. Today, we can imagine that model expanded across billions of users. Images, words, and all communicative units are no longer able to tell the truth at scale. Uh, they're no longer able to tell the truth at scale because truth is collectively assigned by the endless sub-communities that use language for group cohesion, each with its own way of silently operating. And often this is even subconscious. We might be going to, we might be starting to go too far but, but beyond our actual region of expertise with this. But in the post-postmodern condition, in our assessment, it's one in which subculture is replaced by a semiotic survivalist, self-siloing culture. And authenticity, given the impossibility of any one-to-one -one truth, is being replaced by a capitalist realist media literacy and the acknowledgement that the true self cannot be uploaded. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oops. Um, okay, so DJ. Cool. Did we get it all wrong? <laughs> Should I start with a response? Yes. Response? Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the detailed response, indeed. Um, and uh, I think we would need probably very much more time than, than <laughs> we have to, to discuss this. Maybe just a few points that... Um, and uh, yeah, an anecdote about the unreliable signifier uh, in, in a very, uh, very early on. No, not so early on, but let's say in the, in the I think late eighties, uh, I went to Tower Records in Tokyo, uh, and um, that was nine nine uh, stories, and each story was a style uh, or a, <laughs> a discipline or genre, and uh, and there was I don't know indie rock or kind of, I know hip hop and and they were all just exactly like they were in uh, Berlin or uh, <laughs> Cologne, and uh, and then there was one that was like the secret floor that was J-pop, uh, which probably had the, the the mystery attraction that today has K-pop, uh, uh, and and the, the J-pop um, collection had lots of great looking album covers and they they were all kind of modeled after album covers that i already knew <laughs> like there was one uh, there was a there were beach boys there was certain heavy metal records uh, and they were always like just a small detail different or they were even in the same style of an existing western record but but nicer better done so i bought a few of them and the, the, the signifier of these album covers had nothing at all to do with the music. It was the, the heavy metal records had uh, girls uh, singing about school, and it, it was just like no connection, no connection. And um, so that was like um, I think already. I think that this 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 goes to show that uh, the. The, the, the alphabet of um, uh, pop musical uh, utterances uh, has been outside of a, a, a um, one to one uh, expressive logic a long time ago. I mean, Little Richard never was in that logic <laughs> uh, in 1958 or 7. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, what 
uh, the, the, the site of this kind of practices and, and, and is not um, identical with the semantics of larger social orders in the background. So what I was talking about, the, the, the collective, um, the notion of the collective as opposed to the petit bourgeois uh, uh, fashion design, uh, fashion choices in the area, era between 1955 and 1975 uh, is not that this was, there was not really a collective production. It was just that whatever one did had to look as if it mm -hmm. was produced by some kind of collective. But that was not expressive of it, of what had really produced, nor was it expressive of um, the belief system of whoever used it in, in a certain, it was just a, in a certain situation. So that is one thing that I thought that is that the situation that you're describing is not entirely new, uh, although this is some reaction on the, on the on the cultural criticism of of a digital a digital uh, world. You probably always hear that, uh, yeah, but it wasn't it always like that? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, sorry, I have to. <laughs> the other thing is that I thought um, 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 it, 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 that the, the the role of this kind of semantic background um, is also important in the in the analysis of the contemporary situation where like uh, platforms uh, are neutral no, or platforms are are not on one side mm -hmm. or the other no they are not but they are not but they are not indifferent to semantics mm -hmm. so the the the, the um, 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 What's it called? Uh, the attention uh, economy is is uh, is um, uh, probably uh, rude and disruptive and 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 relates to um, uh, to elements of signification that that are not really meaningful, but but they are of course embedded in in, in semantic systems, and they're not just information. They they are uh, they are part of uh, cultural continua that are larger than just their information aspect. Mm -hmm. So even if they are indifferent to being on one side or the other of a conflict or political ideas, uh, they are not in terms of uh, cultural uh, alliances uh, and, for example, the idea what is a man or a woman or something like that. Sure. I mean, I think um, a, point of, um, a point of clarification there. Um, the point was that these platforms want, I think I am Mike, so I think it's good. They, they want activity above all. They absolutely in there, as Julian said before, there's like a physics to these platforms and that physics is certainly not neutral. Um, there's something that's encoded in the protocol of each platform, which does make them partial. It does direct attention in particular ways. And as we see with say Elon Musk, Elon Musk's changes to X versus the way that Adam Masseri is organizing Instagram, they absolutely have a politics. But there's this pretense that the that there's that the code is in the protocol of the platforms themselves, that if there's some kind of remove, there's the ability to have a bit of distance. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I'm not the, saying that they the way they measure it as well is much more on the weighing it in terms of its affective power rather than its informational content, I think. And it's always going to prioritize, uh, yeah, whatever is the most evocative or uh, causes the most engagement, which, which oftentimes is disagreement uh, or confusion or outrage. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's a different way of, it's like suddenly, uh, all of the semantics are, are weighed by their affective content, affective content more than their informational or truth, uh, truthfulness, the right. veracity. Yeah, but it's also always about um, a single person uh, in a relatively isolated environment, uh, even if not literally isolated, but but like with the attention towards the device. Um, um, develops a different uh, affective reaction than the same person would do uh, uh, in a bar. Of course, uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. of this, course, yeah. yeah. And this aspect, I think, uh, uh, really does something to um, to semantics. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and this, is, this is really, I think, the, the a big difference to questions of... of Mobilization, or um, and, and and even to questions like what a swarm is, because it's um, um, the the basis of the the base of the mobilization is 
um, already um, a previous withdrawal from society mm -hmm. and, uh, and a building of a new social or, or quasi-social out of this earlier withdrawal. And uh, when, whereas the, the situation of classical subcultures is um, uh, being kept by power, by the, by the powers that be from socializing mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, wanting to get out into, uh, out of the house. No, that is, uh, and I think that, that is a, that is a, a, a major difference in the, also in the inner workings of whatever is produced by, by such situations. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, are we okay to ask more questions, Koya, or yes, or? Yeah, okay. Um, so, I mean, so one question we have, and, you know, maybe you're going to say, well, this is why libraries exist and that's it. But um, I, I do wonder, like, what happens to cultural memory in a time when very few signs tell the truth or increasingly more signs don't tell the truth. I mean, you're saying that, okay, well, it, this has happened before. Tower Records, J-pop, there already was this disconnection and culture survived. It's perfectly fine. But where do you think, or where do you see some kind of cultural memory going if all signs, signs have become incredibly instable? Yeah, the interesting thing is, I mean, in order to... to uh uh, leave the meaning uh, assign uh, the, the, the original meaning still has to be recognized uh, in order to be uh, um, able to recognize that it shifted mm -hmm. uh, or that it changed the meaning right. and uh, and I think the problem is was, was exactly what you are saying that the cultural memory is lost so that the manipulation of the sign is pointless right uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, but this is a problem I think uh, not so much of digital culture. It's it's uh, um, uh, it's it's that the um, that history writing uh, for events since there are recorded recordings of uh, since there are recordings uh, since there is, is, is uh, um, a reproduction of of uh, technical images and so on um, is has not found a, a way to deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, there is this there is this phenomenon has often been uh, uh, um, 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 beklagt, um, uh, often been criticised um, that uh, um, by just recording something you are not reading it anymore. Mm. You are uh, you're having it. And, um, and you're having archives and, and you look at archives and, and all these internet archives are a good example for it because they give you always glimpses into archives and then you, then you know the rest. And uh, so, uh, this, so you have a lot of uh, basic ideas of historical moments and, and data, uh, but not um, the, the, the key component of cultural memory would be that you would, would be able to distinguish what was how something was meant in a certain period exactly and uh, what the joke was and not just how it looks or not just how it uh, uh, how one can quote it or how one can put it into another context uh, and I think this has a lot to do with, 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 with this kind of recording instead of describing uh, and um, uh, yeah, and, and, and I'm getting, I'm reading about periods uh, like the 80s, and if I, if I hear discussions about the 80s that I experienced, I can only, always, only, always say they get it all wrong. It was all <laughs> completely different. <laughs> <laughs> and what's crazy is we've been speaking with some people on uh, our podcast who say, yeah, but I mean, fanfic is the way the history is written now, and that's fine. Almost since though, like, it should have a participatory element, and it's okay if it's essentially fanfic. And there's just, a, there's like an unmooring of even a kind of historical fact. It's all fan fiction, right? Um, it probably exceeds the time we have to get into that. But um, it is interesting to think about how cultural memory will evolve in a time when the fan fictification, taking the signs and putting them together in some narrative that makes sense in the present, which, to be honest, is what we always do, even when we're trying not to. Mm -hmm. um, but when that's just like fully embraced, it'll be interesting to see how cultural memory evolves. I mean, it, 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 it really depends on who 
is the who has the interest of a reconstruction of um, historical mechanisms. Right. Uh, and uh, the, the the classical, um, I mean. Um, the, the classical historical disciplines have all split into a lot of uh, sub-disciplines that are in charge of more or less contemporary fields, and uh, so they, they are just there. And there is a good reason for it because uh, there are more people living right now than have ever lived, probably, or something like that. No, there is this number. So, so there is a linear, or uh, there, there's a simultaneous history to to study right now, um, and there are also means for that, that, that it, it, there are good reasons to do that. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I, I t totally agree that uh, um, it's, it's uh, on a structural level, it's, it's uh, the, uh, the making of things goes, uh, falls apart. It's, it's, it's like uh, you have the, um, uh, you, can, you can see this um, perfectly in, in, in if, you, if you spend an evening with YouTube uh, <laughs> following your, following your, your, your interest. Uh, um, the way they, they, they um, offer you an archive, the way they structure the archive, um, it makes perfect sense. It, 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 it produces a history, but it's not the history. Mm -hmm. It's not history. It's, yeah. it's, it's, a, yeah. it's another history. Okay, let's read the sign that we have to call it there. But um, Dietrich, thank you. Um, thank you. Koya, thank you again. Um, and thanks everyone for listening. Um, I guess to be continued. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
astonished how beautiful the Rhine is, actually. That was the thing that kind of oh. took me by surprise. It is beautiful. And then today I saw Beethoven's house, or where he was born. So. Wow. Mm. I still have to do that. So I'm, I'm a tourist, I guess. <laughs> Can you hear John well? John is not hearable. Can you hear me? I think it's about the position of your microphone. So I will talk I to don't Derek. Know what it is. Talk to Derek. <laughs> Hi. What I'm have you been doing? to be number three. Are you number four? I'm number four. Yeah. Mm. That's why I'm here, I think. Okay. Behind us, you see. Oh, Sophie is coming. Hi. And Nigel. Free choice of seats tonight. We're not sitting where we were told we were going to be sitting. No, but anyway, I didn't want you to. It's a big honor. Is that better? That you came to Bonn? No. John is still not hearable. Can you say something? Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I think you can't hear. <coughs> John. Um, it's going to be fixed in a bit, I hope. I trust. Um, I had the idea that uh, I, I shouldn't be here because I'm <laughs> way too young. I was born in 1982. Blitz Club was already gone by then. <laughs> um, but still, I will try to get the conversation though. going. Some of you haven't seen each other in a long time. Um, some of you have just uh, briefly met. I had the idea of everybody introducing everybody else. So I will start with Derek, if I may. Um, you might know Derek's uh, portraits of Clint Eastwood, the Spice Girls, or James Brown. Um, Derek is a photographer. Um, among his uh, books are When We Were Young, which features a lot of portraits um, of the new romantic scene, uh, which evolved from Blitz Club. And Derek also generously allowed us to show the photos that are running behind us in the exhibition in a, on a wall dedicated to Blitz Club. Anything to add? So no, no, that's just about right, I'd say. Thank you. Would you be ready to introduce John? Yeah, sure. Do you want me to do that now? This is John Maybury, a uh, filmmaker and video director. Um, we never actually met at the time, but um, John um, very kindly wrote uh, the forward to one of my books, 7887. And you, before you told me that you didn't ask him to, is that correct? I, no, it wasn't my choice. It was all organized by <laughs> third party. <laughs> How did he do? What? It was very good, actually, yeah. He contextualized everything perfectly. Yeah. You know, in, a way, in, in some respects, in a way I hadn't properly understood myself at the time. Because, uh, you know, when I was doing these photographs, I was just uh, basically an amateur snapper. I was working in a day job. Mm. And sometimes I'd turn up at some of these clubs, I'd still be wearing my, the gear that I was wearing at work, usually mm. a, a cardigan and a blazer. So it wasn't really the, the look that they went for. Can I, can I just add among the, main, the, the hundreds probably of music videos that John directed and we have all seen, um, is Pet Shop Boys West? No. It's not? No, I, Derek Jarman directed that. I helped him actually, but I didn't oh, I'm do I'm sorry. It. I did Sinead O'Connor, most of her videos. I'm sorry. I, I did. We should correct Wikipedia. I don't touch Wikipedia, but okay. yeah, I, sh I guess I should. We got um, someone to correct that. But I worked with Nana Cherry and Everything But The Girl. And Sinead O'Connor. Yeah, lots for Sinead O'Connor. You did the video for Nothing Compares to You. I did indeed. Yeah. And I will ask you how, to do, how you did that later. <laughs> but would you be so generous to introduce Nigel? Nigel Coates is um, an architect and designer, and my partner. Um, he's a very talented man. Very what? <laughs> talented man. Very talented <laughs> It's quite hard to hear you. Uh, I, 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 Neville told me that there was a problem with the sound earlier. Have we resolved it? I can hear you in my head. You can, good, yes. anyway. I can hear you, Nigel very well. Yeah. I have problems Maybe I'm my mumbling, or is it my microphone? Um, anyway, yes, he's an architect, a designer, it's mumbling, a monk. Mumbling plus microphone plus monitor. Okay. And also the dimension of the space, which makes it hard to balance between monitor and anyway. We'll talk more about sound. Nigel also um, is the co founder of the collective Narrative Architecture um, today. today, NATO. Um, you published um, DIY style, we would say, today, um, magazines from the late 70s. Um, 
Nigel got legend with um, commissions in Tokyo in the 80s, like Café Bongo, which is also featured in the exhibition, and Nigel also designed the exhibition. Um, so we have a very lively and vibrant uh, um, collaboration behind us. Um, and Nigel also was so kind to recommend to invite Sophie. Can I ask you to introduce Sophie Parkin? Well, Sophie really is an old, old friend. And uh, I guess amongst a hard core of um, uh, Blitz, Blitz frequenters. And um, we still both share uh, uh, other friends who we have this bond that kind of has lasted ever since. And Sophie was one of those arty people because there were lots of art school arty people in force at the Blitz. In fact, you weren't at St. Martin's, but St. Martin's School of Art was round the corner. But you I was probably... at St. Martin's. Oh, you were? At St. Yes. Martin's. Okay, well, that's why. <laughs> so St. Martin's really no, was the I sort went of drip there. feed for the Blitz Club. I think you'll agree. I was at the Blitz before I was at St. Martin's, so I was underage. Okay, so it was sort of, <laughs> but you kind of knew people. Anyway, we, we knew each other then amongst a, a, a group of, uh, a, a large group of others that were at the arty. There were those people who, who uh, painted themselves kind of, um, and, and were always in the photos. But I, I, I guess, um, you were in the photos too, sometimes? Sometimes I was, sometimes but I wasn't. But you weren't looking for the person with the camera? I certainly was not looking for the person with the camera. I was very, very shy. I was, well, uh, yeah, I used to hide from people with cameras. I wasn't posing. And I'm always amazed when I turn up in films, like there's a, a film of the, uh, uh, Spandau Ballet came out with a film couple of years ago well, and, there you were. and there I am in it I was just like how did that happen I didn't even know that you were shy happening. you you you're shy perhaps but I know you as also stridently confident so you're a kind of a woman of two sides and Sophie has actually host for the last many years hosted a, a, a bohemian nightclub in London which in some ways has got uh, got its roots in blitz and before called Vuterines, which is near Tower Bridge. And it's ongoing. Well, I, I just left it. I just left it this year because I thought... it continues, doesn't it? What? It continues. it continues, but without me. And so without me encouraging people to dress up and to be flamboyant, people don't do it naturally these days. They don't do it just for the joy of dressing up like we did. You know, it seems to be, as we were saying, about anything that is to do with today's culture, especially to do with selfies and Instagram and all that. It's about monetizing things instead of just doing it for the joy of being creative with yourself and going out and connecting with other creative people and I think I first started dressing up I don't know about you but it it was to try and find your tribe because that's what you were looking for completely true yeah I mean uh in when when Blitz started I guess we'd been to a few other clubs punk had already kind of re reset the dial on what was possible in London. I have to say that London was filthy dirty at the time. The walls were black. Covent Garden was full of rotting cabbages. You could drive out. I could go out in my little Morris Minor convertible at midnight and I'd be the only car on Piccadilly and you could park anywhere you liked. It was a different place. People didn't go out on Sundays. No shops were open. Um, and most pub... people didn't have cars still in the 70s, did they? I always had a car. Well, well, I'm surprised. Because... You were like just out of architecture school, I guess, no? No, it wasn't quite like I was out of architecture school, but I was, in, I was a young tutor. So I suppose I was a blitz prof rather than a blitz kid. Did you have to hide that, that you had like a... An academic position at the architectural association. I was, a, I was the, um, I was a unit master. Okay. It was very prestigious. 
<laughs> my age. Because all your friends, all your friends were squatters and uh, art students without any. Well, I, kind of, I had a boyfriend who was at St. Martin's. That's how I got connected to Blitz. So, you know, if, if it hadn't been to St. Martin's, but I don't think it would have happened. It was a much more egalitarian situation than... It wasn't that prescriptive about who was what and who did what. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, all the people I knew who'd been at T-Rex and David Bowie concerts in the 70s were the same people who were at Sex Pistols and Buzzcocks and Clash gigs in the 6, 70, you know, 76, 77. And then most of those same people were the, at the Blitz Club too. What was the Blitz Club, John? The Blitz Club? Just, yeah, can you just explain what it was? The Blitz was a kind of dreadful kind of um, cocktail bar in Covent Garden, really. That, but it was a place that Steve Strange and Rusty Egan, these two kids, they'd already done a Bowie night at a club called Billy's. And then to monetize the, the success of that, they moved to this new location on Great Queen Street called The Blitz. You know, and that was the name of the cocktail bar. And it was themed in a very sort of mid-70s way on The Blitz, the Second World War. A sort of 1940s, the kind of fashion... It's part of the retro fashion that mm -hmm. had kind of come out of Bieber, um, which was a big department store that was also about retro. So it was feeding into all that stuff like, I don't know, Rocky Horror Show and the movie Cabaret and The Damned. Mm -hmm. You know, there was that mood going on. And then punk kind of blew that nostalgia out of the water. And then when punk sort of became too sort of monetized by success, by, by the chart, you know, people being in the charts and stuff. Uh, a lot of those same kids just... And also there was a lot of violence suddenly connected when punk became a mass thing by the late 70s. Um, the, the kind of punks and teddy boys started having big fights and then the National Front got involved through skinhead imagery and music. So a lot of us just moved into a different way of looking, and that's really what the Blitz was about. Was mm -hmm. it was still with a punk aesthetic and still very homemade, but it was just not as sort of we were kind of over punk as a kind of style. Certainly mm -hmm. not as a musical style, but mm -hmm. over it as a style of looking. Derek, you um, your, your work evolved out of um, the fascination for the punk scene. <laughs> um, Pardon. You, you, your work evolved um, from like photographing the punk scene, I yeah. think, and then yeah. Blitz came up. Um, how, how did you? What's your first memory of Blitz Club? Well, um, it was um, just a very, very small sort of wine bar, really, as you you said, uh, John. It, and also the the place really had nothing to do with the the new romantics. It was just where they they settled there. We should we should mention that Boy George, uh, Visage, Spandau Ballet, they all um, well, Steve, were regular. Steve Strange, who later became uh, Visage, was it was his night. He fronted the club, as it were. He was the host. Boy George was the coat check girl, but you put your things in the coat check at your own risk, because he would steal anything you found in the pockets. Always. Um, so that's true, it's not just a legend. Oh, no, no a, he's a, he, he was a terrible, terrible thief. True. And he used to go into the ladies' <laughs> loos and he would just nick your makeup in front of you, like you'd put your lipstick in, in front of you, and he'd just, like, nick it. And you'd go, give me my lipstick back, and he'd go, make me. He was always trying to have a fight. So how did, he, how did he survive? <laughs> What? How did he survive? How did you let him... How did he survive? Why didn't you stop him? How did, how did he get away it with that? Very, very, it was very, very... The thing that people don't really take into account is that this was a very small section of, of society in London that were dressing up and going out looking like that. The majority of people did not look like that. And they took exception to us dressing up because it mocked their way of life. And so to go out into the streets, to go on public transport looking like this, 
would cause people to spit at you, to um, run after you, beat you up. I was always having to run into pubs and hiding in loos, you know, where you jump up onto the loo seat so people can't see that your feet are underneath because you'd get beaten up all the time. It wasn't, you know, to do it was an act of bravery. And that's... That is now how I see it. But often, as a woman, as a girl doing it, it was uh, provocative to, to ordinary young men who would see it as a, as a reason that they could call you a whore or a tart or whatever it was that they wanted to land you with. Or a faggot. Or a faggot or whatever. <laughs> but if you were a girl, there was a kind of, you know, sexual aggression to it. You didn't know if you were going to be beaten up or raped. And that was, you know, that was a normal way. And, you know, later on, after I was at St. Martin's, so this was in <coughs> 1980, I went to Leeds in Yorkshire. And the Yorkshire Ripper was going around, you know, actually killing women and um, I was dressed in wedding dresses and I knew that to be provocative like that would mean that I would not be caught by him. It was a kind of protection. It was definitely a protection because, you know, everybody knew who I was in Leeds City Centre. Me and Mark Almond, they both knew. Because <laughs> we were going around in the most ridiculous outfits all the time and loads of makeup. And but it was as though and... one had sort of entered a, a, a voluntary bubble, wasn't it? You were sort of brought into the bubble because you knew some people who were going to the, to the Blitz. So it was all word of mouth or, or, you know, all kind of chat over uh, in, the, in the canteen, in the at the art school or whoever you were with. It was a teeny weeny group of people. Teeny? It, was it wasn't even the whole of St Martin's. No, like it was maybe a hundred people all together. The sound has gone. The sound in the room is, is gone. Can you let us know? Hello. Can you not hear me? I can hear you in my head. Can you let us know when the sound works again? Please? Hello? Up there. No. Can somebody tell us what's happening? Excuse us in the stream, sorry. Mm -hmm. So, so hi in the stream, uh, sorry, we have a little bit of a problem with the audience in the space, you're not hearing us. Um, I'm waiting for an update. Please hold on. Or is there something exclusive that you wouldn't share with the <laughs> physical space, but only with the internet? Is <laughs> this being streamed as well? Yes, it's live streamed. It's working. It's working? Okay. Just Hi. have a pause. So we're back. Okay. With four uh, witnesses of the Blitz Club, Blitz Kids. Derek, were you... Sorry, Sophie. No, I was, yeah. I was just going to add to mm. what Nigel was mm. saying. So when I first came, to, uh, went to the Blitz, I'd come up from where I grew up in Cornwall to come. And I was a freak in Cornwall. I was just like, people just used to shout abuse at me in the streets and, you know, I was like... But so therefore it was inevitable that, that somebody who knew about the Blitz would draw you into it. Yeah, it was, it was Rebecca, our mutual okay. friend, who, who took me along and then we just suddenly went, at last, it's a place where you can actually breathe and relax and be yourself and... Uh, most people thought that because you were in a new romantics club like the Blitz, that they played new romantic music. They did not. I just want to point out they played Gary Glitter and Sweet Ballroom Blitz. <laughs> so it was kitsch. 
That was the point. I thought they were playing Yellow Magic Orchestra and Kraftwerk and that too. Devo that and too. Grace Jones, no? They played all of they those played things. That but it was, it was much more eclectic. There wasn't a regimen, you know, this idea that there was only one thing. It was sort of a... Uh, but they also did play Dolly Parton, you know, it was... And, and wasn't that the collage of all of this that actually kicked off the new romantic style and the music of Visage and Spandau Ballet? Well, it, in no, a way, it no, really, there. it started, mm. like I say, it started with uh, the, this particular kind of iteration started with Billy's, yeah. which was a Bowie night, but there were only so many David Bowie records you could play in a night in a nightclub before people would get bored. So you, it was about mixing in other, you know, Kraftwerk were a very important band at that time. But, you know, like it was also about just, it, it was scattergun. It was a whole raft of different things coming mm. together. So, yeah, T-Rex, Gary Glitter, David Bowie. T-Rex, yeah. Yellow Magic Orchestra. And then more, also lots more electronic records came, came along. You know, mm -hmm. obviously you've got the Human League and another sound. Okay, thanks. Hey. It's like you didn't miss anything of any interest. <laughs> And then there would be sometimes, you know, Marlena Dietrich. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. camp, high camp mm -hmm. all the time. But mostly it was about having fun, so it wasn't... Also, there's one very important element that hasn't really... And it's, it's in your exhibition, um, this subject or this element, and it's a crucial element of this uh, period, and it's drugs. Yeah, drugs were central to it. Which as well was. as alcohol. Alcohol and mm -hmm. at the, the time it was kind of pills, um, which was a, a hangover. So ecstasy was already around? No, no, this was speed, cheap, okay. cheap speed, which there had been a lot of during punk too. Um, and then, of course, the demise of this scene came when suddenly cheap heroin came onto the scene mm -hmm. in London. And it really did for Steve Strange and Marilyn and eventually for George too. Yeah. But drugs were, drink and drugs were sort of this fantastic fusion that fed into the sort of <coughs> Dionysian revelry that was going on. You know, all these people with their beautiful makeup and their hair and their outfits would be in shreds and dripping on the floor by the end of the evening. And then you'd all get onto night buses or onto the tube looking like a kind of <laughs> dissolved dish rag. Thank you. Now we're really in it. Nigel, what is your first memory of Blitz Club? Take us in.
this huge squat. Um, Marilyn lived in the one round the corner with George. Anyway, and we heard that there was a... Melissa lived in our squat, this person now. Um, there was a sale at the theatrical costumiers, Charles Fox. They were closing down their warehouse. I was going to say that. And we all went down there and everybody bought <laughs> whatever... So the next week at the Blitz, Kim Bowen, who's wearing the big square hat, was dressed as Elizabeth I, and Marilyn was wearing ball gowns. And every, yeah, basically everybody... <laughs> for 50p and a pound, you were getting these costumes from West End shows and from theatre. So it, that had a big effect on the look of everybody because it, <laughs> it kind of... Um, so one sale actually made the Blitz Club. Yeah, but style. it wasn't it wasn't a normal sale. It was like the whole <laughs> of the costume out. department of all the theatres in the West End. So it was unbelievable. It, the and treasures, they stank. It was on four <laughs> floors. Everything stunk to high heaven. They stank of mothballs and sweat. You and... could smell people before you saw them. <laughs> but that... they looked great. <laughs> and, and, of course, there was still that element of, you know, people making things themselves and then other people making things for you. So there was, you then got this mad fusion of all this rotting theatrical costume stuff with handmade things and, and, it, and stuff from charity shops. Yes. It, it was a... It was, yeah. um, so it, it, th there was a kind of free energy to it all and a kind of madness to it all. That It's important that that madness... That hedonism, you know, it was a, it was fun. It was really good fun. And as Sophie said, you took a great risk, kind of getting on the tube or getting on a bus or walking down the street, just because to most people they thought you were just making fools of them. Mm -hmm. you know, there was an aggressive. So it was actually normal, like bourgeois people that 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 reacted aggressively. Not necessarily mocked. bourgeois people. It was sort of, it, it was, I don't know. Just, just ordinary, ordinary people, people, working class people. I mean, some people would Anybody. love it because they, they would, I guess they recognise maybe something from their youth or from, for, you know. But it, mm -hmm. the thing is, you've got to remember too that most of us were really little kids. We were teenagers or in our very early 20s at best. And it doesn't matter what you do when you're 18, 19, 20, it's really difficult to make yourself look really unattractive because you're young. Yeah, you know, so it's a sort of, um, and there's an empathy and a sympathy for youth, maybe. Mm. But then we were also quite obnoxious and we looked pretty revolting. So we were, We'd be thrown out of pubs, wouldn't we? Yeah. You'd be not allowed onto a bus because of the way you looked. You would be thrown out of stores. You couldn't go into a department store. I mean, there was loads of things that you, <laughs> we, we kind of knowingly stopped ourselves from being able to do because of the way that we looked, because it, it just wasn't acceptable to go. And we around. did, and we did, did look, look like, like that, that all the time. We did look like that all the time. It, you didn't dress up to go to blow. Oh. No. It was, it wasn't the detail a is of, crucial and I didn't know about it. No, no, it wasn't a fancy dress night. No. We dressed like that. We lived like I mean, again, the girl who it's comes... It's a lifestyle choice. Kim Bowen, who comes around in this sequence of slides with the big hat. Um, I remember bumping into her on the tube one day. She was... She, ha has, she had bright red dyed hair, very long. And she was wearing a piece of transparent muslin that she tied with some string at her waist and she'd rouged her nipples and she was wearing sandals and that was what she was wearing on my. the tube so she was naked my god and she looked fantastic you know she with this white skin and these rouged nipples and this red red hair and she was a beauty but i was like kim what are you doing you're naked on the tube she said i'm going to college and it was like, OK. <laughs> but also, but she, what gave you but this? But also, it wasn't just about the Blitz, because we would... Because there wasn't places that you could go to looking like this other than but the Blitz. But if you were yeah. an art student at St Martin's, which, we, which was really in the centre of London, on Charing Cross Road, you were in a community... I mean, people dressed up to perform in, in college, and they still do that now in fashion to departments. To each other, yeah. 
you know, it's because you're part. You know, I think John's right in the sense that you're, you're, if you're in that milieu and you're going, you're travelling from wherever home is into college, then the art students are always going to be the ones who who are more confident about the way they dress because they feel they feel they can do that and that they must do that. Well, that you must do that, and also I think. You know, seeing in retrospect, I was a vulnerable young girl in London, living by myself. Well, I'd shared a flat with my sister, but I was going around London by myself. If I did not put on this mask, hmm. and even if I did put on this mask, you were being uh, continually stopped by men and asked how much for a blowjob. You know, there, there was this, there was a sexual aggression that would be unacceptable these days, but it was totally acceptable then that this, there was this tension. So well, are you saying that the, that the Blitz Club uh, choices were in some way... Protective. A protective. Yeah, I, I would say. It was the mask. Very, that's, it yeah, was the know. mask in, in order to, you know... Well, as a gay boy, uh, I think it had... I mean, it wasn't that you were propositioned as a gay person. There was this horrible man that stopped me on, Pig, on, um, on Regent Street near Piccadilly Circus once and said, do you know where I can buy a pair of trousers? <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, you can go to the Moss Bros, it's over the road. But, of course, it only occurred to me afterwards what he wanted because that's Aww. where the Diddy Boys would hang yes, out. Yes, of course. Mm. So, but so maybe, um, of course, so sex was boy. everywhere and, uh, and, and, and freely available in certain quarters. Uh, but I think that the, there was a measure that I kind of occurred to me about dressing down because I was at an architecture school and I was a tutor, and I couldn't go there with sort of punk hair or whatever, you know. I, I, I kind of found a measure in between, and I do recall that I, I would wear uh, oversized jackets and a uh, half done up, loosely tied, you know, tie, badly tied. In other words, there was a style thing, and I knew people who went to the Blitz, but I didn't have to go completely over the top. So I was, the balance in my case was that I was, I was a responsible young person who wanted to push the boat out within my institution, but my institution wasn't St. Martin's. It was, architecture world was much more straight-laced. There were no gay people at the AA. There were, the, in, in the architecture world, people wore the most awful clothes imaginable, hush puppies and corduroy say, trousers and puppies. ghastly So, But I really wanted to be an architect, but not any old architect. I wanted to be a special architect. And in the end, all the, all the consequence of all of that was that I started to know people in fashion, Jasper Conran, Catherine Hamnett and so on, and I got to work for them. I made shops for them. So there was a kind of slow drip of effect, even though perhaps I wasn't courageous enough to be like Boy George, but I, in, in, I, I wasn't rejected in the Blitz Club because I didn't dress like that. But you didn't need to be like Boy George. Boy George only had Boy George. I'm just saying you that there a proper, was a spectrum. You had a proper job, yeah. But there, there, I had a, there was a spectrum of people, and it was more about if you fitted in with those people and, yeah. and, you, and, they were, and they were people like you. But it wasn't only about the coding of what you wore. It was about your head and what you, who you wanted to hang out and who your friends were. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it was about being, you know, witty and amusing, exactly. we thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Derek, but, can I ask you, were you part of the scene? Or did no, you no, I wasn't part of the no. server of the scene. Uh, the scene <laughs> yeah. at all, this is why I, I can't really join in and say I was a flamboyant dresser, I was the opposite, really. Uh, there is a couple of photographs of me at the Blitz and I'm just wearing a cardigan. How were you? Jeans. So you were the Levi's. You were the strange guy with a camera. He was the creepy yes. guy, the creepy in guy who shed the blood. Yeah, the first time I turned up at the Blitz, <laughs> wanted to take photographs. Uh, Steve Strange stopped me at the door and he said, "Sorry, not tonight, mate. Private party." 
Uh, but um, I was very persistent. You know, I don't think you get very far in life as a photographer if you take no for an answer at any time. And so I wore him down. Uh, I had to stand out on the pavement for about 25 minutes and eventually, because he got fed up with having to talk to me, he let me in. And the next time I came, probably the next week, he kept me outside for five minutes. And then after that, he was fine with me. You know, he just got used to me. I, don't, I think it would be a mistake to think every single person in the Blitz Club was dressed up because not, not everyone was. There were some ordinary people or people that knew people and he'd let them in. And it was also, again, it wasn't a, a it, there was a kind of regimen to it. It was sort of, it's hard to explain, really. It, but it's, yeah. I mean, the, also what's interesting, I mean, again, when I was living in those squats that I talked about earlier, you know, I'd come home from art school and there'd be photographers taking pictures of George and Marilyn or Jeremy Healy, who also lived there, you know, or whoever. And... They'd be like, oh, they're having the picture taken, you know, the photographer would go, and I'd say, who's that? And, oh, that's someone from the Daily Mirror, or it's someone from the Sun. Mm -hmm. And it was perfectly normal to us that they were being photographed, and then the next day there'd be a spread in the Sun of them, you know, the, these wacky kids who dress like this. And so that was kind of a bit of currency, uh -huh. was, was coverage, and, and uh -huh. Derek's great skill was being invisible, but having a camera. And there was an element of people at all the different clubs, because Blitz wasn't the only club by any stretch of the imagination. There were some people who really wanted to be photographed, that that was adding some currency to their image. Um, so... It's so interesting because we're now really talking about an economy of um, exposure or sharing trust yeah but, the, but obviously this is this is pre, which is complex and no, this is pre, and it's pre, fully understand it's pre social media it's pre but also don't forget we'd also but it is some, somehow we'd, social we'd, media in well, a way it's very social if you're on the front in the national newspaper yeah. that's extremely social but we'd seen what happened with punk don't forget because punk had started yeah. in you know in 76 our friends were on the stage performing mm -hmm. and then when one band got signed and they got shot on the TV show. They, we all watched the Sex Pistols on six o'clock uh, on the Bill Grundy show, and they swore. And the next day, they were on the front page of every newspaper in the country. What is this? Is so interesting. I think it's the condition that has not existed before in history, and I'm not sure if you had it after. Maybe around the beginning of YouTube, you suddenly <coughs> had this term of the bedroom producer. So now uh, suddenly everybody had the tools for production, but also the tools for spreading your work at hand, at home, right? And you had people just recording their albums from their bedroom. Hmm. And that was a moment when there were all kinds of stories also about people who just made it because now everybody could suddenly make it. And it seems to me around 1980 uh, in London, there was a similar moment of like you can get anywhere from like one day to the other. Well, don't forget, we'd, like I say, there'd been this model, which was punk, where our contemporaries, you know, many of our contemporaries, almost within the space of six months, went from being on tiny stages in tiny rooms to being on top of the pops. Mm -hmm. Whether it was the Pistols, the Buzzcocks, Susie and the Banshees, whoever it might be, you know, they mm -hmm. were all our friends and our contemporaries. Um, so that was the sort of, okay, if, you, if you're in music, you can do that. At the Blitz, there were people who, we, it was all art students, or not all art students, but lots of art students. I wanted to be a filmmaker. I didn't know what that meant. I mean, I, I did know what that meant, because I'd actually already worked for Derek Jarman on Jubilee, doing props and sets and mm -hmm. costumes and stuff. So I, I'd had an insight. But Derek wasn't Hollywood. He was a small independent filmmaker. Mm -hmm. um, but there were, there were other filmmakers. There were painters. There were people who wanted to be writers, people who wanted to be journalists, which was a mystery to me why anyone would want mm. to be a journalist, but some people did. Were you um, already... Sorry. No, and so... And actually what happened was people just became that. Almost by invoking the words, they did become that, because what happened was that suddenly there was ID magazine, first of all. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you did stuff for ID. Did no, you? I didn't, know. 
Um, but you know that they ID photograph people on the street at Camden Lock or you know wherever it, at Beaufort Market or wherever it might be on the King's Road, and so kids were the subject. They were the content of the magazine, and then later on, obviously, you know, um, with the face, it was like a. It wasn't an in-house magazine, but it was a kind of. It was the same generation, so it was creating a media because the rest of the media wasn't interested. I and mean, in a weird way, the, the face kind of invented the whole notion. But that wasn't the style. reason for it happening in the first place, was it? It was For what happening? For the, the people weren't kind of wanting to be the subject of media attention. No, 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 but, but it was Far a byproduct. They wanted, just, we just wanted to have a good time. No, but it was a byproduct, and there was an element... There, there were a group of people amongst us who I was talking to Derek earlier, who I said, who were kind of camera whores. Yeah. Who couldn't not be in front of a, pic, a camera. Well, not, St yeah. Steve Strange, for instance, used to say to me, oh, everybody wants to photograph me. Everybody wants me in Germany. They want me in Switzerland. They want me in France. They want me... I can't do everything. I can't be everywhere. So sometimes I just send George instead. <laughs> and it's, it was absolutely true because he was his sidekick and George was so hungry for it. And... Um, but it's interesting. Others that, of us, uh, others of us weren't but because the, but we also had the, the our media, other thing. The media, as it as was, and which again, I mean, I know on one hand we're talking about the national press, but the national press in Britain is so parochial. I mean, no, that's a, that doesn't really make that's an oxymoron to say national press is parochial, but it. it, it, it can you say that again? I'm sorry. To say that, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm phrasing it in the correct way, but the you know the the British press tabloid press in particular is so banal and its content is was especially back then so banal you had sort of television personalities and girls with their tits out and then there was nothing there so these freaky kids was it was content i suppose before content mm -hmm. existed difference does that make sense yes yeah, and, but also something you could no? sort of laugh at or you oh, oh, okay mm, silly kids. but there yeah. was no monetizing of it no you yeah. just people just took your picture but and Derek, you'd... did you sell did you sell your pictures to any tabloid newspapers no i didn't the first um publication my photos from the blitz club uh was in was the sunday times and i think that was may 1980 and then a few months later they were in the face I think that was issue number five. After that, I found that um, people opened the doors in the clubs for me a little bit more because they could see my photographs. But when you started, were you in, did you think that this was a phenomenon that was needed to be documented? Or was it that you were fascinated by what was happening? What was it that, did, that led you to that particular source of... Of I, I suppose I was just drawn to people that wanted to be seen, really. I was just giving them a bit more added publicity, I suppose. Um, I was still in the advertising business at the time. My career as an advertising art director was gradually going downhill, and my career as a photographer was going the opposite way. So I thought, yeah. What else I, were you photographing? I was photographing skinheads as well. Sometimes on the same day, I'd be photographing skinheads in the afternoon. I'd go to Blitz in the evening. But it was subculture. Yeah, subcultures, really. Because times. it was relatively easy to do it. I mean, it wasn't always easy to photograph skinheads because some of them were quite aggressive. But um, from a pictorial point of view, it was quite easy. Really, not many other people were doing it either. Whereas uh, with the Blitz and, and later on the Camden Palace, there were often plenty of photographers there. So what, what I would do is I'd always be in the corridors or outside the toilets. That's why my <laughs> photographs are normally just of one person. I'd stop them on the way. The toilets were your studio. <laughs> well, nearly, the, the, the outside the toilets. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, some of these clubs were very dark, so you really couldn't see what was going on. But anyway. there's a tradition of this kind of club, isn't there, the, of small clubs where mm -hmm. people of like mind uh, feel better together. 
and there were various clubs throughout 20th century in kind of in Berlin and in London, in Paris, there were famous clubs that had the, that, that sort of benefited from the fact that they were, they were relatively kind of closed and perhaps quite underground. Well, and also, it's another interesting thing, actually, the, again, pre-social media, um, we were somehow, like we all went, we got the ferry and went to Paris to go to La Palace, like a big gang of us. Um, so we, t we must have taken a tube and then a train and then got on the ferry and then got off the ferry onto another train into Paris, gone to a night at the Palace and then got back on the train, back on the ferry. So, and then later with Freddie Laker, I was talking to someone about this earlier, you know, for $99 you could go to New York and back. So we'd go to the Mud Club and to the, you know, and I went to the opening of the Palladium. Um, you know, there was stuff, there, it wasn't just London and there were other cool kids and you did get to know those other cool kids in other countries and you saw other cool bands in other countries. And this was all on, I was, you know, I was still an art student. I was on a grant to go, I wasn't a rich kid by any stretch of the imagination, you know, I would do, um, but somehow we managed to get about. There was a whole scene in Florence in the. We of... never had any money to buy drinks in the clubs, and you'd always have to find rich older people to do to that. To buy your oh, drinks. That was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so it's interesting that there were, the, the, there were these kind of eruptions all over the place of this thing. It wasn't exclusive. Mm. I mean, London is always is a particular city for sure, and it was a particular scene. There was There's a... also a historic sense of theatricality, which is probably the categoric difference to New York, which is very all is about public life and sociality, but the, <laughs> well, the dressing up thing that has no place in history there. It, right? did, it did kind of happen a bit, though. The Mud Club, and there was a, mm. a fantastic place that was a little bit later called The Pyramid, which was a, a really... Don't forget the gay aspect of this, the queer aspect is very, very important. Mm. Um, and The Pyramid was, you know, it was an astonishing place on Avenue yes. B or Avenue C. Um, and there, you know, that's actually where I first saw uh, Lady Bunny, RuPaul would have been there, but this is long before RuPaul became this weird phenomenon that she is now. Uh, so, you know, there, there were... And gay bars also linked countries internationally because mm -hmm. they were the only places you knew you were safe to go to. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the, the queer part of it was really important because the, it hadn't actually been legal in Britain for that long to be gay. Mm -hmm. And it's 1968, it was as though 1967. 67, yeah. Right and the beginning of our it show. Was the, to, yeah, that was to, the law changing, gay the police identity. didn't see it that mm -hmm. way. They were still harassing people. Well, I mean, they were still harassing. I mean, that's another interesting thing too, because the, the, it's interesting in your show that the kind of queer presence, you know, you can, there's, there's Fassbinder and obviously General Idea are there. Um, I suppose you could say Philip Johnson is there, but we don't really adopt him as a patron saint of queerness. A bad gay. Uh, yeah, he's definitely a bad gay. Um, but it, it, in a weird way, postmodern is queer, isn't it? I mean, it's just queer as a, as a, as a notion, it's, because it's so off kilter. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's inherently camp, isn't mm -hmm. it? So it's there's... throwing, tearing the rule book up and putting things together in inventive ways. Mm -hmm. Or like sh just shifting them slightly or putting them somewhere where they don't belong. Yeah, really. it's, and disquiet. <laughs> and with it's not only rupture, it's also slight change. And appropriating changes, right? and reformulating in yeah. such a way that you're, you're not following the rules. Yeah. And that is sort of happening in my world too, in architecture, that people were just kind of becoming more interested in historical things and taking the historical thing and then maybe turning it into something else mm. without really saying, oh, this is postmodern. It mm. was just in the air. I mean, I loved when you Just fun. The speaker. It, isn't it just about having fun? It was just a new way to have fun. Yeah, and just being to annoying. be creative and to outdo each other in your madcap schemes or ideas. But I do remember being there at, at the Blitz and somebody said, 
uh, Mick Jagger trying to come in and Steve won't let him. And we went, good, <laughs> we don't want those old wrinklies in here. And I remember being really embarrassed when my mum turned up with Andrew Logan and... Of, uh, of London, sort of and I thought they were too old to be in our space. Your mum came to Blitz? My mum. Wow. Yeah. Um, his, That's not was, a thing mums should do. He was a, he was so, a, he so was his a, an was... extravagant bohemian icon in her own right, okay. by the way. She yeah. was a major fashion editor in the 60s and early 70s, so she was quite a player. Mm. And she was on television all the time, and she, was, she wore extraordinary clothes, and she was drunk most of the but, time. Uh, did she I, I love him. What your speaker... She did. She got in, but Mick speaker. Jagger got turfed out, and, and David Bowie was allowed in. Of course and I think Be because he's David Bowie. Yeah. Huh? Well, because Steve and he was Strange has a crush over. on him. He was him. casting for a book. <laughs> for Ashes to Ashes. Yeah. He casted his. Uh, but your speaker earlier was Ashes. fantastic. The guy who, mm -hmm. who performed the Dexys Midnight Runners song for us. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, he he was fantastic. I loved what he was saying um, there about the in quoting that lyric, which I, I actually don't remember, but there was a, the passage about sort of Baudrillard and J.G. Ballard, and I can't remember what else. Because, you know, a lot of us also, you know, we did wear all these things as kind of badges on that, mm -hmm. you know, and sort of, there was one particularly stupid boy I knew who, he was, sort of, he was actually sitting in our squat one day reading, I think he was reading Nausea, Maybe, but he was holding it upside down because he was, he was like looking super cool, like James Dean reading Sartre upside down. And th there was a kind of that was so sexy to see someone being pretentious and getting it completely wrong. So there was sort of a homoeroticism involved in stuff like that. That, but it, you know, that, that that lyric was very telling. That thing of that that list of boxes to tick of references to make um i found it very moving so I, I look forward to watching that again on social media him singing that song mm -hmm. thank you closing question um asking for very short answers if blitz club wouldn't have happened uh how would your life have been different Nigel? What did it it, was, it was the nighttime alternative <laughs> university for all of us, and we all. I was the only architect, I think, but there were lots of only other other in other disciplines. So and it, it would London would have been different, and uh, you know I think it was a very very special place and a special moment. Thank you. And it only lasted for such a short time. It was only like for a year. Yeah. It was nothing. But then every club was like for a year. And then you moved on to the next place. And with that, it wasn't always the same group of people because then there'd be some added extras. But, you know, in, in your photographs, Richard, it's Sam Ritz Club, it's Billy's, it's... Um, what was the other one called? I don't know. The, the, the beetroot. The beetroot. Um, and it, it was like a, at a certain point, there was a few of them. So you did a kind of dance through them. And, uh, and when it suddenly got so big that it became Camden the palace, palace. Camden mm. Palace, it then... To, to fill that space, which was huge, wasn't it? Yeah. It had to have ordinary people come into it, at which point then you became the freaks that drew the ordinary and people stopped in. stopped going. And mm. you stopped going because mm -hmm. it wasn't interesting. interesting. But you kept on going to other people's houses for house parties, and that was, you know... That was how it kind of continued after that, I think. I, I like the Camden Palace, actually, from a photographic point of view, because by that time, I think that had a capacity of about 3,000 people. And uh, there were a lot of tourists that came from all over the world, and they would try to uh, ape the Blitz kids and the New Romantics. Quite often, they'd get it wrong, but often it would be in a very photogenic way. So they'd do it wrong, but it would still be right, yeah. really.
<laughs> so I liked it there. Also, there's a lot more space. Oh, then there was the Café de Paris afterwards, yes, right. wasn't yeah. it? That's yeah. it. And that was much more stylized, as mm -hmm. in you yeah. had to dress up like a 1940s person mm -hmm. or a 1930s person. John, how would your life have been different without Blitz? <sighs> Who knows? I really don't know. Uh, did it... Um, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm met people that create I'm, a social network. Yeah, I mean, I, no, like, I already knew most of the mm. I mean, I met people I loved and I had fantastic sex with people and took fantastic <laughs> drugs. So <laughs> it, it enhanced my life enormously, but I don't know if it changed. And maybe I would have been a more serious artist if I hadn't gone there. And how did you make Sen Senator O'Connor cry? How did I what? How did you make Senator O'Connor cry? In the video, nothing compares I, to you. I didn't make Sinead cry. She, I did 13 takes of that song, and she cried in five of them. Thank She's you. She's a great performer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, Thank you John. My pleasure. We see each other tomorrow at noon for Sylvia Levin's lecture on helicopters. <laughs>